Okay, so it's day number three of NakaCon, and well, this year I got press privileges, which is super cool. Uh, so we get to do something really fun today. We get to go spend a little time with Ben Bell. So I'm gonna go interview him about his experiences in brewing sake. I hope you guys enjoy. Well, although it will be probably a pretty long video because well, we're gonna be talking about science and alcohol. Two great things, so I hope you enjoy it. Oh, hands on deck! <laughs> I can't believe it, dude. I've been looking for you for literally like years, man. Vashti. Alright guys, what's up? I'm here with Ben Bell. Now, Ben is a sake expert. You have been fermenting sake and producing it in all aspects of the, of the craft for how long now? Uh, well, I worked at a sake brewery in Japan for two years, a uh, better part of two years, and I started home brewing sake about 10 years ago in wow. my home state, Arkansas. Uh, a lot of people don't know, Arkansas is the number one rice producer in the United States. Uh, that's where it comes from. Yeah. Arkansas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I worked in the drinks business uh, starting in 2004, and I was actually a wine expert. Uh, a wine expert. A wine. Uh, no, I was not a wine expert at all. <laughs> uh, my knowledge of wine was, you know, it was where anybody's would be when you first start looking at it. You know, uh, I knew there's red wine and white wine, <laughs> and that was about it. But I had to sell it, so I wanted to learn more wow. about it. Yes. And, you know, when you kind of have that, like, scientifically uh, tuned mind you want to like get into all the details and yes. you know figure out as much as you can and really understand like you know why are these things different and that takes you on almost this like cultural journey of uh the countries where these wines are from and learning about their food and their climate and it, all of those things put together kind of paints a picture of the bottle the bottles that are in front of you which to me is pretty fascinating and then I wanted to learn more categories other than just wine, so I started learning spirits, and because Arkansas is the rice state, uh, sake was always kind of tumbling around in my mind, and we didn't have a lot of sake in Arkansas, right. so I didn't know much about it, but I was curious, and then that led me to traveling to like New York City and going to sake events, and then from that, I started getting sake professional certifications. So I went to Tokyo and got an advanced sake professional certification. Pretty much right after that, I started my first training at a sake brewery in Japan because I was always interested in uh, production and see like, you know, maybe we could make sake in Arkansas. So I wanted to kind of like explore that and go as far as I could with it. And usually I was in, my, in whatever sake group I was in, I was one of the only people who was interested in in doing production, so uh, that led me to actually going and training at sake breweries, and I trained at one for two weeks, and that kicked my butt pretty good, and I learned all about how terrible my Japanese was. You know, when I came back from that, I knew I had to prepare the language a lot more and uh, do things to get ready for the work in the brewery, which is basically like factory work. Um, so you're doing like hard factory work in a foreign language, but there's a technical wow. <laughs> element to it as well, because of course when you're uh, fermenting and doing stuff like that, you're dealing with microbes and there's a lot of science that's happening too. Yes. And yeah, it always kind of killed me a little because I love the science part so much, but that's a, a lot of advanced Japanese that uh, while I was working, it, it was hard the to big, get to that level. The big words, right? Like, oh, yeah. yeah, the big words that were we struggle to learn in English. I can only imagine how difficult that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So the, this, that some of that stuff is is pretty tough. You know, I feel like I got what I went there for, which was t t to really get my head around the process of making sake. And I was very lucky to work at a, one of the best commercial sake breweries in Japan. Um, in my opinion, uh, that brewery's name is Nambu Bijin. Uh, I still, you know, kind of represent them sometimes at events and they're going to be helping me open my sake brewery in uh, Arkansas. So yeah, we have a, a really good relationship now and it came from kind of making that jump 
to yeah, living in Japan and working at a sake brewery. So how, how long were you actually living in Japan? Two years, yeah. So yeah, 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 because it was two years and my training was two years because the only thing I went to Japan for and the only thing I've ever gone to Japan for is for sake. So gotcha. uh, people ask me sometimes about uh, cool places to visit and things like that. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, you, you would think I would know these things, but I really do not because when I was there, it was it pretty was much business. just working all the time. Yeah. yeah. So I worked six days a week. And uh, I was told by other people who've worked at sake breweries, like six days a week's pretty good. They're like, oh, you got a day off. That's awesome. <laughs> oh. I'm just like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. wow. But my seventh day was my Japanese lesson. So, uh, so was, and it was like in another city. So about half my day was taken up, like taking the train to the city, getting this lesson, coming back. Uh, yeah. So it really was just kind of head marathon. down, working. It was a marathon for sure. <laughs> it's one of those things where... When you do something a hundred times or five hundred times or a thousand times, it it just becomes kind of like second nature to you. And I, I feel like that that's the place where I'm speaking from now about sake in some regards. There's still like plenty of things that I don't know. I'm not a master sake <laughs> brewer. And it, in a way, you can never know all of it, right? right? Of course, there's always new things, which is one well, of the beauties of it. And there's that element of, you know, chaos, the... the you can do. You can only do so much, and until you have to just let nature take its course. I mean, you're allowing a, a living creature to, yeah, consume sugar and, and produce for sure what you want. So. Yeah, and actually, we have two living creatures that we deal yeah, with. So gosh, you guys use two. That's right. Yeah. So not just yeast. This is yeast is very common for, uh, you know, you know, of course, any kind of fermentation. You cannot do this without yeast. Right. But. We also have another microbe uh, called Aspergillus orizae, also called kojikin uh, in Japanese. And that is a fungus, and we grow it on the rice to convert the starches into sugars. Because, of course, yeast cannot eat starch, which is basically long-chain sugar, right? We basically get the koji fungus to do that step for us, and that's our malting step. That's what you would call malting. Now, if you're making beer, right. you start with barley and, and cook it. Well, yeah, but in actually, essence. you can you can get the malting happening uh, before you do the sort of like the uh, I think that's the mash mash step in beer. I think so. It's like where you're yeah. sort of boiling it um, with barley. Of course, it has to turn its own starches into sugars too. Um, but you can with barley, you can just get it wet. And it will start doing that process all by itself. So, really, I so, did yeah, not know that. It releases, uh, you know, amylase, and amylase breaks down the starches into sugars. Um, the reason why that set step doesn't work for sake rice is um, so when with barley that brewers use, the germ is still in the in the grain, but with uh, and the germ is what releases the amylase. Uh, with sake rice, we actually mill that off. It's one of the first things that comes off when we mill down the rice, and you have to mill the rice to make sake. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of like you've handicapped yourself a little bit, but <laughs> but by adding this koji step, you actually introduce this, this whole realm of other flavors that I think is uh, essential to the nature of sake. Like, if you take out that koji step, Mm, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure you can really call that sake. <laughs> it's not uh, as good. It's not as good, but you... So, a part of the nature of sake, when you talk about the flavors, um, if you asked me what's the number one difference between sake and other drinks flavor-wise, I would say that's umami. And umami is a relatively new concept, I think, to people outside of Japan, but it's not that old in Japan either. That was, uh, well, the, the idea of umami uh, is just been around for quite some time, but it, it, it being proposed as, as like a scientific flavor that your tongue can taste, that was, that happened in the 80s by a Japanese scientist oh. who said, you know, you're usually taught that your tongue can taste four different, you know, tastes and you, you We've probably all seen that uh, tongue map, that chart of like different places on your tongue yes. that taste different things, which is not exactly accurate, but <laughs> it's yeah, it's close close enough. Uh, but he said, okay, you can taste sweet, salty, sour, bitter, 
but his proposal was that you can also taste a fifth thing called umami, and it, it, he basically demonstrated that your tongue has receptors for it all over your tongue. So there's no particular area that does it. Uh, and the receptors are for glutamic acid. So oh, okay. glutamic acid is umami, basically. And it's not just in sake, it's in any kind of fermented food, uh, it's things like stewed tomatoes, uh, aged yes. cheeses, ton of glutamic acid, uh, so also a ton of umami. We, and so we've been consuming it our whole lives, but we've just never just know. thought of, yeah, I didn't know there's a, like a word for that very specific flavor. Um, and it's kind of one of those things where like, if you're never taught it, you also never think about it. If you don't have a word for it, yeah, then you, you're also never gonna really like think about it or maybe notice it. Um, but I find with sake, cause sake has a lot of glutamic acid and it comes from the koji step. Uh, so okay. Okay. without the koji, you don't get the glutamic <clears throat> acid, but uh, sake, no matter what its style, always has this under layer of umami going on. And one of the things about umami and probably the reason why it's been overlooked and it's easy to overlook is pure umami, which by the way, if anybody wants to taste uh, pure umami, uh, I recommend buying some MSG, which is perfectly safe and uh, put that on your tongue and then uh, maybe just for funds, uh, get the exact same amount of salt uh, and put that on your tongue for a comparison. and you can compare how, how, how different the intensity of flavor is. And I think what you'll see is salt and sweet things register very strong on your palate with a very small amount. With uh, MSG, and it's basically pure umami, it kind of has to like sit there for a while and it's a sort of, sort of low level, you know, flavor that might remind you of chicken broth or something like that. More, more subtle. It's more subtle, yes. so it's harder to pick out. But once you sort of learn to pick it out, then, then you really see, uh, particularly in sake's case, how different it is from other alcoholic beverages. For me, that's interpreted as more of a, an underlying flavor almost mm -hmm. that's there. Mm -hmm. But it, again, like you said, it's one of those things that you don't know what it is, you don't pay attention to it, and it just kinda, it just kinda slips through your mind. But mm -hmm. it's consistent with any type of sake I've ever had. Yeah, and interestingly, um, it's not in J Japan, it's not just sake that you'll find that consistently with because the, the koji step is also a step done for many, many traditional Japanese foods. Uh, so this is how you make soy sauce, miso, ah, yes. uh, natto, if people are familiar with natto, it's a, like fermented beans, um, soybeans. Yeah, yeah. Um, so each one of these foods are super umami rich because they all share that step. Uh, so you, you could say like, like that particular flavor is part of like the identity of traditional Japanese food and drinks. Uh, so, but of course you find it all over the world too. Obviously But not. because that, that, of that shared step of growing this fungus on soybeans or rice um, to start to basically as a primer for uh, fermentation. Uh, yeah, they also share this like really sort of like strong backbone of umami. Yeah, which is super fun. Soy sauce has a ton of umami. That's the, <laughs> most of what it is. Uh, now, is the same fungus used for other Japanese foods like that? You know, like to prepare the natto and things uh, like that? Yeah, yeah. So basically, yes. In Japan, it's all Aspergillus orizae. Uh, I'm pretty sure about that. In other parts of uh, East Asia, there's cousins of Aspergillus orizae. Uh, I think one is called Rhizopus that is... Uh, Use, I think it's called like red koji, um, but yeah, there's different kinds of koji and they have kind of like different color names. That's like a good shorthand. There's yellow koji, white koji, black koji. Um, <laughs> those are all used for various kinds of alcohol. Um, and yes, yeah, so there's some other like cousins around in Chinese traditional food or uh, Korean food or you know something like that. So yeah. There are different kinds, and then within Aspergillus orizae, there's different kinds for making sake, um, and even within sake, 
there's multiple kinds of Aspergillus orzai, um, depending on what style of sake you want to make. Right. So, uh, like, like com comparable to wine yeast. Yeah. Right. So yeah. there are various strains of, of yeast that we use for, for different types of, you know, yeah. you're making a red wine versus a white wine or maybe sure. a, an apple fruit based. Yeah. But of course in sake, we have, you know, multiple kinds of yeast as well. So it's like, so, a, yeah. again, yeah, you have your two microbes, they both have their own characteristics and they both have multiple variants that you'll use depending, depending on what you're sort of looking for. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Which is pretty excellent. Um, one fun fact about like the Aspergillus family is someone asked me at a seminar earlier if uh, you know if, it, if that was like you know safe because because uh, it's it's you know of course it is or you would not really like be do, doing this uh, I think yeah. somebody would have noticed that uh, Aspergillus <laughs> like is making people sick like very early on yes. um, but some of Aspergillus uh, some other cousins in that family are well-known producers of uh, like toxic, uh, what do you call it? Like maybe a neurotoxin? Uh, something, oh. yeah, something, something quite dangerous, yeah. So are these related maybe to like the ergot families of, like the they are, of rye and that, that type of thing? They're kind of molds. Uh, okay. probably, probably what I have told you is like the extent of my knowledge. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was probably I, I was talking a good game right up until that that, that point. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. I get a little lost. Uh, you know, of course I'm always interested in learning more about that uh, because that's pretty fascinating to me. I'm always fascinated by uh, two things that are closely related, but one is super safe and the other one is crazy dangerous. Yes. Um, but yeah, for of course for like growing it on food. Uh, like Aspergillus orzai, uh, you not only is it safe, but it adds some really wonderful things to it. And actually, one of the great things is, while it's growing on the rice, you can start, you can eat it, and de depending on where it is in its growth, you you can taste the rice getting sweeter uh, because it is it's breaking down the starches and the sugars, right? Makes so sense. by the end, it's actually like quite sweet. The rice is quite sweet and pretty tasty. I like I like tasting the the koji. I don't know if I'd make a meal out of it, but yeah, it's, it's fun. Good on occasion. Yeah. Now, bit. is the when you when you grow the rice for using in sake, is there a particular point in that conversion that you want to harvest, or do you harvest early and then use controlled? Well, there's sake rice has some known properties that. Are a little different than other kinds of rice so sake only rice you kind of want these big grains um, so what that means is when you grow the rice it can become very top heavy and uh, if you're not careful and so, sometimes even if you are careful uh, like a strong wind comes through like bef right before harvest you will yeah all of the uh, stalks will just fall over and then you have to harvest it off the ground which is possible but it's a real pain um, but yeah there's some things like that that make sake rice a little different but in terms of you know letting it reach maturity and things like that it that's about the same for for any kind of rice but what happens to it once you harvest that's that's where the variances really start to come out and one of the biggest things about sake rice and making sake is how much are you milling the rice before it, it you know, starts to be steamed and made into sake? So, right. uh, the so how that that poli we call this polishing. There's different kinds of milling. Some milling, like for barley, you just break that barley, and right. that's fine. You're just cracking it. Yeah. Cracking it, and with rice, that's a no-no. <laughs> so you do what's called polishing, where you're taking off just the outside of the grains. Slowly, yes. yeah, slowly, and the outsides have more fats and proteins. They give you rough flavors, maybe off flavors. And a good grain of sake rice has pure starch in the center. Sometimes you can see it. It's called a shinpaku, which means white heart. And yeah, if you have grains that ha have shinpaku, you have some good sake rice for sure. And yeah, the idea is you want to mill. You know, ideally, you want to mill all of the rough flavor things 
off of the outside yes. and brew with that pure starch and then you get this really nice clean pretty sake so yeah that's that's the the how you treat that rice uh before it comes sure. even before it comes to the brewery yeah it's super important <laughs> and how much the rice stands up to milling without cracking is one of the differentiators of good sake rice and not good sake rice so uh in a way the actual flavors that the rice will give it, it's not as important as you would think uh not as important compared to just how well does this rice stand up to milling right yeah now when you guys okay so you, you you've harvested the rice you've uh you've milled the rice you wash it at that point mm -hmm. Um, and then hydrate it, I would assume. Needs yeah, well, specific... interestingly, while you're doing the washing step, the, uh, your, the, the rice is start, starting to take on water, so your moisture content is going up, but then you do a soaking step right after washing. And the soaking okay. is where you get your water content really like dialed in before steaming, because that's going to affect how much water is in, in the grain is going to affect how that rice steams. Okay. And All yeah, right. so. You might pick up from that that, you know, if this moisture content isn't right, the steaming won't be right. The steaming's not right. This will Just affect every down. other thing. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it's kind of like a snowball effect. And because of that, washing and soaking is tremendously important. Uh, and you can check your work with uh, uh, how you did by simply weighing your rice before and after. Right. And it, then you have that percentage increase of, you know, moisture content. So. Uh, but in a practical setting, in a brewery, uh, you don't have time to check all of the rice that you have washed. Right. So you may do some checks before you start re really doing like the full, you know, full batch of rice. But uh, mostly you look at it. You look at the grains and you can see the water coming into the grain. It starts in the outside and goes towards the middle. And, wow. and with a lot of practice and some skill, you can kind of guess the moisture content just by looking at the grain, and then you just kind of go with that. That's the way it's really done in breweries. That's where that practical knowledge, the expertise comes in. Oh yes, and th that you do not get <laughs> until you just do it. Okay, so harvested the rice. Yeah, we're done. You milled the rice. Milled it, washed, washed it, it, soaking. Next, next steam it. Next is steaming, okay. and a commercial sake brewery will steam up to about one metric ton at a, at, a, at a time, and that's done every day. Oh my gosh. So that's a lot of rice. That's that so is. much rice to be steaming at once. And the place that I worked at, so some people have like a nice sort of a winch system that will bring up the rice in layers, and that will save your arms. Uh, but the place that I worked at did not have a winch system so we just two people would get up with shovels and just shovel it all out so oh you're God. going to every day uh p pick up 500 kilos of steamed rice um and that's basically how your day starts that's like nine in the morning you've done some work before that but once steaming starts uh, or stops in the morning then like your rice is fresh and ready and like your day's like begun begun Time to um, go. So yeah, that's a heck of a way to like start your day. Really, um, that job is actually physically so hard they would not let me do that uh, for the first year I was there. Oh I mean, if I had come to the brewery like really in shape and strong, they would have let me do it because it's not <laughs> it's not technically very difficult. Uh, but yeah, I was I came pretty weak, unfortunately, <laughs> and it took about that long to get strong enough to do it. But once I did, I kind of insisted on doing it. Uh, partly because I wanted to show that, like, yeah, yes, I, I'm, like, do it. I'm not avoiding hard work here. Like, I'm very much willing to do this. So, yes. yeah. Well, they take you much more seriously, and I hope so. Invest more into you, you know. Like, yeah, there's some way, ways where, like, if my Japanese isn't good enough to like tell you, tell you, you know, how I feel about doing these various jobs, at the very least, you know, I can show you by like physically doing them doing and you know <laughs> even volunteering to do it so yeah, yeah. yeah that was pretty important and then once the steaming is done now you're going to uh, uh, the rice will go up to the koji room where you uh, you know uh, 
sprinkle the spores onto the rice and that room is like basically a hot room and the temperature and humidity are very tightly controlled right so yeah you make these basically perfect conditions for growing the kojikin the way that you want on the rice and the way that you grow it uh, depends on the kind of rice the milling rate and the style of sake that you want to make right so these are all variables into the choices that you're making in the koji room now will the temperature kind of regulate the rate at which that happens and does the rate <clears throat> of that koji step affect the flavor tremendously figured, yeah it's very very important <laughs> so uh, just to give you an example if well I mean if the temps too low uh, inoculation might not happen right. and so it, yeah you're not getting good growth um, but re really the the big fear is go going the other way, it getting too hot. Um, once the growth really gets going, you're more regulating the temperature from a stance of keeping it from getting too high too fast. And if it gets too high too fast, you basically have overgrowth uh, on the outside of the rice and it's going to break down some of those leftover fats and proteins that may be on the outside and it's going to bring a lot more of those flavors into the sake but and this is where the temperature and humidity humidity work in conjunction with each other if you keep the temperature from going too high and you pull back the humidity to where the fungus is not getting a lot of its humidity from the air it will actually send its uh, its little like probeater things mycelia uh -huh. uh, into the grain seeking moisture and once it goes further into the grain, it's, it, it's uh, get, getting to that starch center. Yeah. And it, now what is being uh, uh, broken down is more of the pure starch and less of the rough stuff on the outsides. And if you can get the koji to do, th do that and do it well, that's how you make the best sake in the world. That's, that's, your, that's your top grade So stuff. this is probably one of the most critical steps. Yes. Obviously, everything up leading up to that is is key because if you don't if you don't make it to that step with the right stuff, yep. then you're gonna have bad results. That I think that is exactly the right way to look at it. Everything is key leading up to that, but there's a That's saying. That's your make it or break it point. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying uh, uh, in bre sake breweries, which is it's Japanese, but it's ichi koji ni moto sanji komi sanji komi. Um, which yes, is, that's, I'll, I'll put that. <laughs> yeah, the, so first is, uh, <laughs> number one is growing your koji, number two is the moto, your starter batch, and then three is your main fermentation. And it, I think if you don't know the process, you would think, uh, well, main fermentation must be the most important part, because that's when you're making when your you make alcohol. alcohol yeah. uh, but, yeah, no, of, co that's, of course. Uh, that's easy. Once that's you've easy. gotten to that step, you've done it hopefully all of the preceding steps correctly and then you just have to let really it take its you, course. You, I mean of course you you know you're ch you're checking on your batches and you have some stuff to do there but yeah maintaining you've, temperature I, I, I would venture to say you've already done the hard most of the hard work yeah yeah so it's pretty pretty important and then so I mentioned doing a starter batch uh, that's kind of the next step where once the koji is grown, it takes about 48 hours to, to grow that. Uh, you That goes to a small room with some small tanks, uh, and that goes in with water, yeah, your malted rice, your koji, steam, some more steamed rice. Because the koji is made enough amylase, uh, the, am uh, the amylase breaks down the starches and the sugars, right? Uh, koji's actually made enough amylase to not only break down the rice that it's growing on, but also break down more steamed rice. So, okay. yeah, you can add in more steamed rice and that will still get bro broken down into sugars for the yeast to eat. Uh, so you do that every time you add uh, koji to a tank, you're also adding steamed rice. Unless you're making a style called all koji, which is, yeah, oh. not, yeah not a regular Right. Kind of style of sake, but you know, very interesting one. <laughs> um, the brewery I worked at actually made fantastic all koji uh, sake, but yeah, uh, you, 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 this is the batch that's going to, the small tanks are, are, are basically going to kick off fermentation, but uh, you add, at that point, you add your yeast, and you 
really what you want for the starter batch is for the yeast to uh, multiply. And this is going to be like the main gro growth phase for the yeast. And then right. by the time you put that starter batch into a big tank, the yeast, there's enough yeast cells to just like get right to work doing fermentation. They're not spending energy on replicating. replicating. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so also another very important step, right? <laughs> yeah, they're all important. Yeah. So this is, this is, you could almost equate that to like proofing your yeast before you bake a loaf of bread. Okay. Yeah, I don't know much about making bread, so. Oh, you're not a bread maker? <laughs> oh, okay, not, okay not yet. so, not so yet. maybe instead uh, we could relate it to wine, because I, I actually brew a lot of wine on my own. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's just a hobby of mine. So some wines actually require that you just sprinkle the dry yeast in. Others, would, you would want to make some type of a sugar solution, whether that be fruit-based or if you just use some kind of sugar source. Mm -hmm. And you put your yeast into that, allow it to sit overnight, that will allow the yeast to sort of get that process rolling where it does most of the replication before you add it to your batch of, of mash or wine, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is kind of similar, it seems, to proofing your yeast. I guess. Yeah. It's yeah. Relatable. Maybe. For sure. Yeah. So uh, very another very important step. And then once you're done with that, by the way, the aromas from the starter batch are so good uh, because that ye yeast is, there's a lot of yeast compared to how much you know, sort of mash that you have right there. So, so if you have yeast that gives really sort of fruity aromas, fruity floral aromas, the whole uh, starter batch room smells like that, and it's so nice. It's uh, one of my favorite things. Um, main fermentation room smells great too, yes. but the starter batch room is That's just the at. best aromas. Yes, I, I think. <laughs> yeah, and then of course from there, you go, uh, you put your starter batch into a larger tank, and you add more water, more koji, more, more steamed rice. And you actually do that uh, two more times. Uh, it's like a three-step process, the total process of you know, building up to, to your, your you know, big full batch. So that's a little involved too, but yeah. uh, the process is not so difficult technically from, from then on. At, at that point, you're kind of, uh, you mix it once or twice a day, and you're checking your acidity levels every day, um, check your specific gravity, and that's gonna tell you like, are you on track or not? And certainly the tanks are, are pro probably gonna have some kind of temperature control on them. Uh, they may be jacketed tanks. Um, I'm sure there's some places in Japan that have no uh, jacketing whatsoever, and they kind of let it go, but uh, probably, I think in general, the industry standard is to have some kind of like cooling control to yes. do some temp control. Uh, but of course, the old way we didn't have a glycol jackets, so <laughs> the you you know you want slow cold you know slow yeah I say cold fermentation <laughs> colder <laughs> fermentation because uh, you want to have yeah the slower it goes the more you get these nice uh, sort of clean flavors. Yes. And so the, that means in Japan you would brew through the winter, and that still is the traditional brewing season. Uh, and the, the brewery's not heated, uh, so yeah, if it's cold outside, it's cold inside, and that will slow down your fermentation, and you, you know hopefully give you the style of sake that you want. So so it's low and slow. Low and slow, slow and slow. Yes, yeah. it's kind of the same way for wine too. You, you know you. you I think for wine, it's uh, what like 68 to 72 is kind of the Fahrenheit. It's kind of the range that you want. Mm -hmm. Do you know about what temperature range you, you would want oh, to ferment? Yep, uh, I know these in Celsius uh, okay. <laughs> because I can convert. That's cool. okay. That's good. good. <laughs> uh, oh boy, we well, yeah, one of my favorite things about working in Japan was not using the yes. Fahrenheit system. It's metric everything. And uh, it just makes so much more sense. One day, yes. one day, one day we will we can only get go. to it. Um, for now, we just have two liter of Cokes and stuff like that. Yeah, that's as close as we're getting. Yes. But uh, yeah, eight degrees to uh, 13, 14, something like that. That's kind of okay, the temperature so range that you're in. So it's, it's a little cooler. It's cool, yeah. yeah. Um, in beer, that's actually very equivalent to lager temperatures. Yes. So the time and temps uh, that the fermentation is done at is pretty close to lager. 
So for beer people, I just say, you know, lager attempts. And even though I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, like they do, so. <laughs> yes. And I'll put like right here, so you know, what'd you say, eight to 18? Uh, eight, to, eight to 13, 14, eight something to 13, like that. I'm sure there's yes. people that go maybe higher. And uh, that's like, yeah, it, every brewery is a little different in some ways. There's a saying in Japanese, that the Ban Ryu, which is 10,000 ways. They say there's 10,000 ways of making sake, which really means there's an endless number of yes. ways. Uh, so I can give you sort of like some standard temps, but <laughs> it's important to know there's always an exception to those at every single step. It's yeah. going to vary based on individual preference. and Yeah. Oh, I know for a fact there are breweries that do what's called like hot fermentation, where like they just let it go and, just and let it get <laughs> as hot as it wants. <laughs> and yeah, like I've never had those breweries sake but I hear it is quite good so that's actually something you know maybe they're I'm, onto something maybe they are on to something uh, I'm early in my career as a sake brewer and those are the kinds of things that I'm I look forward to learning over right. the years and decades yes yes so what else we need to cover I mean after that it's just bottling and packaging that's yeah well, you know, it. <laughs> so, I mean, it has to get uh, in the bottle because if it doesn't make it in uh, the bottle, then it doesn't show up at all. That's know? right. Well, but but uh, either before or after bottling, we pasteurize, which is a very uh, important step in sake. It, do you do you pasteurize wine? No. Okay. No, uh, we use uh, sodium. Mm, oh yeah, that's right. You, and, uh, no, yeah, you use like sulfites. Potassium, yeah, yeah. potassium metabisulfite, and yeah. uh, there's another potassium sorbate at the end. Yeah, yeah, to, for preservative. So I was talking to a winemaker uh, a couple weeks ago, and I showed her a chart of various chemical levels in uh, beer, wine, and sake. is like a comparison chart. It's a pretty cool chart. Um, and she saw that the sulfites were zero for yeah. uh, sake, and she was like, "How is that possible?" You know. I was like, I don't, I don't know. We just don't put any in. She was like, you don't add sulfites at all. And I said, no. And they said, well, how, how do you keep it like shelf stable or, you know, uh, uh, yeah, so, sort of prevent early spoilage. Uh, and I told her the, what we do is pasteurize the sake and actually pasteurize it twice. Um, and that step actually predates Louis Pasteur's, you know, discovery of, uh, pasteurization. So the Japanese were doing this before he figured it out? By a few hundred years. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> now they didn't understand it on the technical level that Louis Pasteur did. Sure. And uh, by the way, I don't know if you're from, if you know this, but Louis Pasteur's career was largely largely centered around beer making. Yes. Uh, yeah. I did know Which that. is pretty yes. awesome. Y yes. If you are not familiar with this, <laughs> you should like, go check it out. Do check it out. It's super cool. Louis Pasteur is a pretty, pretty amazing person. Um, but yes, of course, when you're learning about pasteurization in, you know, you know, a school in America, we this is part of the getting a Western centric, you know, uh, historical education. Like, oh yeah, Japan did pasteurization for a, a few hundred years before Louis Pasteur, but that is not in our books. No, I never uh, heard that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they knew that by heating up the sake it would last longer and stay like better longer longer after uh, going into a cask or staying in a tank or whatever so yeah that's a really important step for sake it can actually have a uh, uh, important impact on on the flavors mm -hmm. so uh, it it's not just about keeping it better longer uh, sometimes it's a style choice for the flavor profile that you're going for uh, but the standard is to pasteurize twice, um, w once right after fermentation is done, and then usually you, you let that sake sit for in bottle or in tank for a few months, you know, two, three months. And the second pastur pasteurization will be done right before bottling, like from the tank, of course. If they're, already, if they're aging in bottles, you basically put all those bottles into a big like sort of bathtub looking thing and uh, heat those up. Once that, once you're done with that, send it to the labeling machine, you know. Send it through the bottling machine, but just turn on the labeling part, <laughs> and uh, yeah, then you're kind of like good to go from there. So yeah, it's a pretty critical step. Um, and then j just to add one more like technical step, also after filtration, we do fine filtration, 
which could be done with activated charcoal or something like that, but basically it pulls out some bad proteins that can cause spoilage later. But if you don't do that, that's a style called Marocca. And uh, unfine filtered, unpasteurized, and also undiluted sake, because you brew up to you know, maybe 19%, something like that. And then traditionally with the sake, you dilute it back down with the water that you brew with to 15, 16% to take that alcohol bite off. Right. So uh, sakes that are undiluted, unfine filtered, uh, unpasteurized, that's called Maroka Namaginshu. And that's, that's be, for the, the, the tough guys. Yeah, they could, that's like kind of a wild style. And yeah. <laughs> people like it. Like unsurprisingly, it's you know, there's an uh, an intrigue about you know what does sake taste like if you don't do those steps. Uh, it doesn't, unfortunately, because it's not pasteurized and not fine filtered, um, it doesn't travel very well. So you don't see a lot of Maroka Namagenshu maybe in the U.S. from Japan. There's some, I think, but. Uh, in Japan, you can get it. It's kind of like a treat, you know. You know right. uh, I'm sure there's some people that that's all they want to drink, but I think in general, it's a good thing to have every now and again. But if you want to kind of like sit sit down and relax, uh, drinking a sake and have just kind of like a session, you know, uh, drinking and talking with your friends, that's a pretty big style to be <laughs> like that, drinking that's all the time. The, more prestigious occasions then. I suppose, you yeah. know, yeah, maybe special, kind of special occasion, but right. mm, yeah, for sure. Wow. Yeah. Who knew that there was so much that went into the process of making it and then so many different variations. Endless. For the outcome. Endless variations, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's fascinating to me. You know, you think about things like beer and wine here in America, or even you could look at distilled spirits, you know, vodkas all kind of have the same flavor to them. There's a little variation, but mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, rums, <clears throat> you know, those kinds of things, even with wines, when you get into like white wines, there's, you get those subtle flavor profiles that are specific to that type of wine. But mm -hmm. in general, you know, a Chardonnay is a Chardonnay, yeah. you know, uh, so... I almost feel with, with sake is is a much more complex variety of... Well, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. I, I would say every major category of alcohol has, a, it, it has its unique set of variables that when you, when, you, when you start, it's relatively straightforward. But then, then as you set out on the path to you know, mastery, you realize, oh, there's so many choices that you can make that maybe you didn't see when you first started. Uh, I think winemaking, beer, spirits, they all have those, but they're just, they're different, they're different things. Right. Um, with wine, um, you know, there's, you know, like with Chardonnay, you can oak the Chardonnay or not oak it. And then you right. have all, all sorts of gradients in between and of course, uh, yeah, your acidity levels, are you doing malolactic fermentation? Uh, so there's a ton of choices that you can make. And then of course, in the world of wine, you have you know, uh, a, a thousand different grape varietals, yeah. technically that you can use, <laughs> although like it, it usually gets narrowed down to you know, a big four, five, six, something like that. Right. I like all categories of alcohol and I like to sort of geek out about them. Seeing all of that complexity is one of the marks of, you know, a real, uh, what would you call it? Um, it's something that is a, what I would think of as a, like a legit realm of, of, of study or, yeah. uh, it's a, I would almost call it a craft, a craft. Well, yeah, yes, it is a craft sure. for sure. Obviously. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think, um, if sake did not have that level of complexity, uh, as as you start to uh, want to to understand it very well, it would not be very interesting. Not just to me, <laughs> but like I think you know most anybody, and you probably wouldn't see that many people making it right. or wanting to make it. Um, and of course, sake is still pretty new outside of Japan in terms of production, and and we're just now seeing it in uh, a lot of the great sake that's being made in Japan right now start excuse me start to come overseas but 
it's a uh, I think the future is really bright for sake yeah, yeah. so I expect it to grow worldwide and of course I want to be a part of that so Heck yes yeah, yeah that's part of the reason why I'm here uh, at NakaCon doing you know sake seminars and you know spreading the good word about sake right yes mm -hmm. And, and by the way, the seminars, I'm sure you guys have already seen in the videos, but they were really fantastic. And, uh, you know, I think you've done a, a really great job with not only, you know, sharing some experiences that, you know, a lot of folks don't ever have, but at the same time, educating them. And, and you know, I noticed yesterday there were people asking questions and, you know, your seminar kind of ran over time mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. because people took that interest in it. They, they yeah. wanted to know. That's a good sign. That's usually a good sign, yes. right? Yeah, yes. for sure. So I think you're doing good things, and hopefully yeah. we'll see you maybe next year. Hopefully, yes. Plan on it. crossed. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Ben, I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, anytime we can talk about alcohol is a good time. Yes, always down for that. Now we need to go drink some alcohol, but you're not coming for that part. So. <laughs> we'll see you guys later.